Good morning. Uh, my name is Dave Weatherell, the business manager here at Lamont Company. Our presenter today is Ernie Rector. Uh, Ernie began working as the market manager handling the industrial water and wastewater markets for the Lamont Company in 2010. Um, his previous experience was as a water operator and laboratory technician at a public drinking water utility for over 25 years. He graduated from the Delaware Technical and Community College with an AAS in chemistry technology. Now, for today's presentation, Ernie will be taking questions as the webinar proceeds, responding to your inquiries at the end of the presentation. You can enter your questions in the chat box on the right side of your screen during the presentation from Ernie. Ernie, it's all yours. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate the introduction and welcome, everyone. I'm, I'm glad that you can join us today. Again, my name is Ernie Rector, um, and we're going to talk briefly today about turbidity, uh, what it is, and some ways to measure it. Uh, I, uh, I spent 24 years in the water wastewater industry before coming to Lamont, so uh, turbidity testing was a part of my every day for a very long time. Quite simply, the definition of turbidity is cloudiness or haziness. Uh, you take a sample and you have a clear container, your ability to see clearly through to the other side uh, is a reflection of turbidity. The harder it is to see through, the more turbid it is. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's a pretty good, simple grasp of what turbidity is. Uh, it's, it's haziness in the water, um, things that uh, prevent you from being able to see clearly through it. There's lots of different causes of turbidity, and that's really related to the source of the water that you're sampling, whether it's uh, a public drinking water system, or if it's a uh, natural water, a stream, pond, stormwater runoff, things of that nature. Um, in natural waters, you can get a lot of organisms. Um, there can be things getting into the water from erosion, um, construction runoff. We, I mentioned stormwater. That's a big one now. Testing turbidity on stormwater runoff is a good indication of how well uh, you're managing to filter or treat that water before it hits the, the environment. Um, drinking water. Uh, Basically, the, the concern when you're in public drinking water is that it, turbidity is made up of a lot of little particles that are floating around the water and they're associating and disassociating. There's a lot going on and that's why turbidity is kind of difficult to measure because it's, it's really dynamic. Uh, it's kind of changing and fluctuating all the time. But the, the reason that we're most concerned of it in public drinking water is that, like I said, turbidity is a lot of little particles and those particles can literally uh, shield pathogenic bacteria. They can use them to hide from chlorine, in essence, so that uh, they are not killed off when you chlorinate the water, and then when the chlorine dissipates, which can, which can happen fairly rapidly in some situations, they can simply reactivate and start to breed again, and you've got a pathogenic bacteria problem. So it's just a good indication of how well treated the water is, and uh, its ability to uh, not produce pathogenic bacteria, which you can't, can't have in drinking water for obvious reasons. Um, natural waters, it's more of a, a case of um, if waters become very, very turbid, light can't penetrate all the way through, so that's bad for aquatic life and plants, things of that nature. Um, it can also, if there's too much stuff floating in the water, it's tough for fish to, to filter through their gills and to get oxygen. Uh, so, again, it's a good indication of how healthy that uh, natural water is. So, units. Uh, the one you'll probably see the most, at least uh, in the USA, is nephilometric turbidity units expressed as NTU. But there are other uh, methods out there. There's the Jackson Candle method, which is a very old method. Uh, and it's probably still in use some places. When I started in 1984 at a public drinking water utility, uh, it was still being used some, not, not often, but uh, it was still around. And, and quite simply, it is a tube uh, with increments on it, and it's on a sliding stand. And at the bottom of the stand, there's a spot for a candle and you light the candle, fill the tube up with your sample, look down through the tube and move it up and down the stand uh, until you can't see the candle anymore. And when you get to the point that you can no longer see the candle, 
you look on the side and then their increments are there and it tells you how turbid the water is. Uh, an ephlometer or an ephlometer uh, is basically just an instrumentation or instrument that can measure uh, turbidity. Uh, and again, I break it down where you get it from the nephla for cloud and metric for measure. I don't know that you really need to know that, but it's interesting. A uh, turbidimeter is one that um, can measure from two different angles, and we'll, uh, we'll discuss that a bit more in a minute. EPA really uses NTU. Uh, they, they want you to report, if you're a public drinking water system and you're reporting turbidity for compliance, they want you to report it in NTU. Um, basically, it, light scatter. It, it's, it's influenced by the size of the particles in the water, uh, how the, waters, how the uh, particles rather are behaving. Uh, they're moving, they're flipping over, they're, you know, connecting up with other particles, they're breaking apart into other shapes. Uh, color can be a, a big concern if you're, if you're testing natural water, certainly. You can get some color in those samples and that certainly will affect uh, the ability for a, a beam of light basically to, to shine through that sample and to be registered on the other side. It'll increase your turbidity levels when in fact it may not be as turbid uh, simply being caused by color. Um, total suspended solids is, is really what we're talking about here. This, the, the solids that are suspended in the water and it changes again, it's very dynamic. Things are going on all the time. So getting a good true turbidity reading can be a bit elusive. Ratio metric, uh, it, it, the ratio metric method, and I bring this up because our turbidity meter, Lamotte's turbidity meter is a ratio metric meter. And you'll find if you really read, that most of the field units out there, at least uh, for testing, are ratiometric, even though they don't always express that in their literature or in the manual. Um, it's it's taken. It's got a ninety degree detector, and I'll show you a diagram here in a minute of what I mean by a ninety degree detector. Uh, and it has another detector in it. Usually, some have even more than that. Um, you're, you're really interested in drinking water, you're interested in very, very low levels of turbidity. Uh, natural waters, you're probably going to be interested in higher levels because uh, it's not as treated. So, so with natural waters, there's there, certainly there's meters that can test for it, but one of the older methods and one of the most used methods is a SESHI disk. Uh, which is just a black and white uh, disc uh, that's attached to a cable or a string and the cable or the string has increments marked on it and you stand over your pond or your lake or river and you start to lower this disc into it and when you can no longer see the disc you look at the increment on your line and that gives you uh, your turbidity level so it's it's really easy. Um, they tend not to be expensive, but again, they're not, it's not as accurate as a meter, uh, but it, it can give you a ballpark and it's very easy and quick to use if you're out in the environment and doing natural water testing. So for public drinking water, uh, you're, you're not allowed to exceed one NTU um, at, at the outgoing, at the effluent of your plant. Um, anything over that could be considered a concern for uh, contamination from pathogenic bacteria, and so you're not really allowed to exceed that. Uh, basically, in a month, you have to be under 0.3 NTU most of the time, 95% of the time. You can go up over that sum, but the more uh, samples you collect that are over that range, you get out of the 95 percentile and you're going to be in violation for that month and then you have to take steps to uh, rectify that or explain why that occurred. Uh, and at any time, if it gets over 5 NTU, that's a problem. That's a violation right off the bat. So usually you try to maintain it around 0.1 NTU, which gives you a bit of a safe buffer. Um, that's uh, the utility that I worked for. That's, that's the number we shot for all the time. Um, so yeah, you, you, if you're a public drinking water utility, you're, you're trying to keep turbidity as low or as close to zero as possible. And that's why with the turbidity meters that you're using in a public drinking water situation, you're really interested only in the very, very low ranges, um, hey, under 5 NTU and certainly under 1 NTU um, and down to you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.1 lower if you can. So very low levels. 
So there's different analytical methods that are listed for how you can test turbidity. Uh, ISO is a 7027 water quality determination. Um, the one that in domestically in the USA that you're going to be up against is the 180.1 uh, EPA method uh, for turbidity, which basically outlines uh, the criteria for what the meter uh, that is doing the measuring, how it's set up, what kind of light source, what kind of angles, what, what it has to be able to do. Um, there is a reference in standard methods, the 2130B. Standard methods is a book that has all the methodologies for analyzing water. Uh, if you have access to a laboratory or a testing facility, uh, I can guarantee you there's a, a copy of standard methods or probably multiple copies of standard methods around somewhere, so you can always pick it up and look at it. Um, and there's numerous ASTM methods available that can be, you can look them up on the internet and they're available to you. So the difference between what I talked to you earlier about uh, a, nephil a nephilometer, a nephilometer, and a, a turbidity meter or a turbidimeter, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, basically, a light detector is at 90 degrees. Um, the reason that that is is that it allows you to shoot the light through more sample, uh, which will give you a more accurate reading because you're covering more. Like I said, it's very dynamic in that sample that you have. That the, the water in there, the turbidity is changing and fluctuating all the time. So the more sample you can encompass or measure, the, the, the more accurate your reading is going to be. Uh, there is also a detector that can go at 180 degrees, and, and that's for uh, usually used for higher uh, measures. And um, if you have both in there, then that's considered a, a turbidimeter. Um, you, you can, for uh, public drinking water systems, get by with just a 90. Most of the ones you're going to see out there now have both in them. Some, some even have more. Um, there's two types of uh, light sources that can be used. The, the incandescent or tungsten balls, which are considered white light, are what's required for the 180.1 rule. There are some exceptions, but they specifically have to be EPA approved exceptions. Uh, mostly what you're going to see is a tungsten type. Uh, and that's really great for very low range, uh, but the, the, the tungsten bulb should really, that type of meter is really only useful if you are doing compliance testing for public drinking water utility and you're trying to be in compliance with the 180.1 rule. If you're doing natural waters or anything with a higher uh, turbidity, then you're probably better off going with the other alternative, which is an infrared or LED bulb. It's just better suited for those higher ranges. Here's a quick diagram of what we're talking about, um, your lamp or your light source, and in this one, that's basically a representation of what the tungsten looks like. A lens to focus it uh, through an aperture, and then it goes through the sample, uh, deflected at a 90 degree, um, and you can see that basically covers, covers a, a lot of the sample, uh, and then it hits a detector, and the detector is what measures the difference. The amount of light generated at the beginning as it passes through the sample, light is scattered um, or reduced because of the turbidity of the water. And then when it hits the detector, the difference between the beginning and the end is reflected in how turbid the water is. So the 90 degree angle is better at uh, the lower ranges, anything under 40 NTU. Um, the higher ranges, uh, the 180 tends to work a great deal better, especially over 500 up to 1,000, even 2,000. There's some meters out there that go up to 2,000, some more. Um, usually when it gets over, I think like 600 NTU, somewhere in that range, it, they switch over to what's called uh, AUs or attenuation units. Um, Attenuation units and, and NTUs are equivalent. They are directly comparable and can be used for reporting. Though if your meter reflects it as AUs, if you're at 600 AUs, uh, if you're reporting it to the EPA, they're going to want you to put 600 NTU on it just for reporting purposes. But they're, the, they're equivalents. They're the same thing. Some, some meters will use AUs but simply reflect it on the readout as NTU. Um, on ours, we reflect it as AU simply because we want you to know what it is we're using to, to collect that sample, but the, we do get a few questions on that, and so they are equivalents. So an ISO design uh, will have that LED. Um, internationally, uh, laws vary quite a bit uh, governing uh, testing 
uh, drinking waters and natural waters. Uh, there isn't so much of an exclusion uh, for the LED when it comes into doing compliance type sampling. And so you, you, you encounter the LED infrared type uh, light sources more often. And again, they're a lot better at testing, certainly at higher ranges. Uh, but if you're EPA, then uh, you're going to want to probably have a tungsten light source in there. Um, unless you're using a meter that has a specific exemption, and there's only a few of those, and you really have to look on EPA site or contact the EPA to find out which particular ones they are. So that'll be part of the research you do before you make a purchase. So I'm not going to read the 180 point one rule uh, to you. You can certainly go and look it up anytime you want. Um, EPA has it right on their site and uh, it will basically tell you how the build of your meter that you're using to measure how that has to be, what what the uh, temperatures are, what the ranges are. For public drinking water utilities that are testing for compliance, your turbidity meter has to go up to 40 NTU. Zero to 40 NTU. It, it can go higher than 40 NTU, but it has to at least go to 40 NTU. So when you're doing your research for which meter you're going to buy, if you're going to be using it for compliance sampling, make sure that it at least goes up to 40 NTU or you will not be able to use it. So this goes into a bit of the explanation that they give you about the sensitivity for it. And again, um, we're talking about very, very low readings. And this, this mentions here about the 0 to 40. Um, but the sensitivity of it down to 0 0.02 NTU. Again, this is all information you're going to want to you're going to want to check with, and you either contact the manufacturer and ask them if you're unsure, or a lot of times they'll list it right in their uh, descriptions, um, in the manual, that type of things. You you can find these types of this type of information. You're going to want to make sure that it complies with this if that's the kind of testing you're going to do. Pay for you to get a meter and find out that it doesn't have some of this and you go to use it and the EPA won't accept your, your numbers. So when should you use what? Uh, I, I touched on this a bit. Uh, 180.1, which is measuring turbidity for public drinking water utilities in the United States of America. Uh, you're going to want to go with the tungsten, um, unless you can find an exception. But usually, you're going to want to go with a tungsten type light source. Anything else, natural waters, environmental testing, stormwater runoff, whatever, you really are better going with an uh, infrared, LED type light. They're, they're just so much better at color compensation. You're, you're more likely to get some color in your sample in those situations. Again, um, the LED source minimizes uh, influence of coloration. It doesn't completely eliminate it, and if the sample is really, really darkly colored, that, that can be problematic. Uh, but for a lot of it, the LED will help compensate for that, and you'll certainly get more accurate readings, where the white light tungsten type is it's really good at very, very low levels. And again, you're, really, you're mostly interested in under 5 NTU, certainly under 1 NTU, and then all the way down to 0.3 NTU. So we're talking very low levels. And it works well at, at those levels. Uh, much above that, and it, it starts to get problematic. So in summation, what I really want you to carry away from this is that a turbidity is not, it's not like a, a directly quantifiable uh, entity. Uh, if there's chlorine in the water, you can measure and find out exactly how much chlorine there is. If, if there's, you know, the alkalinity of the water can be tested and, and you can get an exact number if you do the test right. Turbidity is fluctuating, it's dynamic, it changes. So what you're trying to do is just get the best reading that you can. And to that end, meters will use, um, they'll use averaging. They'll take three uh, quick tests in a row and then average it out to try to, to try to balance that out. Or the ratio method, which I don't know how much you know about ratios, but like a three to one ratio or you know five to one ratio, basically it's taking multiple readings and equating them to what are the most common denominators and providing you with a, a, a a number based on that so it, it basically is more accurate than simply taking one quick reading and going with that it, it, it helps with the fact that this is dynamic none of them are perfect but what we're trying to do here is just get something that's going to give us the most accurate reading as possible we're also saying that it's usually best to test as quickly as possible that's true 
uh, it's again, it's things are going to settle out over time, and certainly if you if it's been sitting for a while, you're going to need to invert the sample a few times before you do the testing because you need to resuspend the particles because that's the way they were in the actual system. They're not all settled out in the system unless it's a dead line or uh, standing water. Um, but even so, there's still things floating around in it. So it's better the quicker you take the sample, the more accurate it's going to be. Maintaining a constant lamp temperature, this is important. Um, that I'm not saying that you, if you're doing two samples a day and one in the morning and one in the afternoon, you have to leave your meter running all day. But if you're doing multiple samples uh, right in a row, uh, I would go ahead and leave the meter on for as long as you possibly can because once that, that lamp uh, hits the right temperature, you don't want to be shutting it off, turning it on, shutting it off if you're doing a lot of readings in the row. If there's a large gap between them, um, it's not as important. But if you can leave it on, if you're doing a lot of samples in a row, it's probably best if you do it that way. Also, the sample cells uh, or the tubes have a mark on them to show you how to line them up in that sample chamber. Uh, the tubes are made out of glass, and glass uh, on a uh, microscopic level is uneven. It's it's not going to be exactly the same no matter how nice the glass is. And there are really expensive cuvettes and tubes out there that minimize this. But to a degree, they're all going to be that way. So where the arrow is, if you line it up that way, that is going to be the, the optimal place for the light beam to shine through that cuvette to give you the best reading. You're, you're, you're trying to figure out how much light how much it changes from where it's first generated to the detector. So anything that comes between that light and the, the detector at the end is going to affect your reading. So even variances in the glass will affect your reading and that will throw your accuracy off. So definitely line it up. There'll, there'll be a, a mark on the sample cell. There'll also be a mark somewhere inside the meter that you're supposed to line that up with, but it only takes a few seconds. Uh, take your time and make sure it's lined up properly. When you're doing a lot of samples and you're pulling the tube out, filling it, slamming it in, taking it out, putting it back in, sometimes it can be easy to forget that. It's important to just take a second and make sure it's lined up properly so that you can get the best reading you can. I also want to mention uh, real quick before I go into a couple questions here, and this isn't a live webinar, so I'm, I can't take live questions, but um, I, I will try to answer a few questions here and then I'll give you a, uh, you can leave questions in the comments and I'll try to keep an eye on this and answer as quickly as possible or I'll give you a email here in a moment. But um, another thing about the tubes is that, again, it's about shining light through that glass. So anything that obstructs that is a problem. So make sure you keep the tubes clean. If they have smudges on the outside or marks on the outside, that's going to affect your reading. So you, you need to keep like a lint-free cloth around um, and, and try to keep those as clean as possible. If you get scratches on them, there is a school of thought out there that says that you can put a few drops of silicone oil on it and rub it in and that will get rid of the scratches. I, I don't believe in that. I think that adding a, a thin layer of oil to it is going the wrong direction. That's only adding more stuff between the light source and the detector. Uh, these things are not that terribly expensive, so I would say if you get a scratch on them, throw them out. Uh, use a new one. Uh, get Buy some new ones. They're not that terribly expensive, but once it gets a scratch on it, that's going to be a problem. I would simply get rid of the tube. Uh, I wouldn't use it anymore. Um, we use, and some other uh, companies use, like an annealing process, which basically just means that they're after the tube is made, they're heated again. Uh, so that the molecules of the glass line up better. So again, even on that level, the, the, the amount of light that's refracted matters. So we try to get those molecules lined up as close as possible, and that helps. Um, so yeah, that's just all things to consider. And again, if you've got questions on it, I'll try to answer them as quickly as you can. Just a couple of quick questions that I know come up quite a bit. Uh, and the first one is calibration. How often? Uh, it really depends. It depends on what kind of testing you're doing. If it's compliance type testing, uh, you, you need to calibrate daily, sometimes multiple times during the day. Um, if you're doing natural waters, things that then you're doing basically just for information collecting, you may not need to calibrate as often. It's usually, all these meters come with standards and you can buy standards. There, there's a lot of different kinds. The zero, one, and 10, uh, and 100 are probably the most common. The zero, one, and 10 probably being the most common. Uh, but if you've calibrated your meter, and again, if, if you're in compliance, you still have to calibrate uh, daily 
anyway. But if you're unsure if your meter needs to be calibrated, take the standard, a new standard, and put it in. If you put the 10 NTU standard in it and your meter goes right to 10 NTU without you doing anything, and you put the one in and it goes right to one without you doing anything, it's probably calibrated and you're good. If it has trouble finding it or, or lands on a different number, it's probably time to recalibrate again. So it's just a real simple way to check uh, to see if it's calibrated. Just put a, put a standard in and see if it reads it correctly. Um, other than that, uh, how to keep the meter clean. There's a sample cell or a uh, chamber rather inside of most of the meters and it's clear also. That's where the sample cell sits while the beam of light is shot through it and the detector on the other side. But it's clear because light has to pass through it also. And again, it's something else that's in the way of that light beam. And if you're at using it out in the field, dust is going to get into it, dirt is going to get into it, you're putting samples back and forth. And if you're not careful about putting those samples back and forth, you can get scratches on it. Um, for, for basic cleaning, use a lint-free cloth and you can use like a, a, an ammonia um, a solution or something like that to clean it. Anything that's not going to leave too much of a film. If it gets scratched up, your best bet is to contact the manufacturer and see what steps you can take to get that whole sample chain chamber replaced. Um, sometimes companies that rent meters, they can do that for you, or if not, the manufacturer can, uh, and that's a good way to keep track of that. Um, as far as collecting a sample, uh, like I said, testing as quickly as possible is usually best. If the sample is really cold and it's a really humid day, you might have problems with condensation on it. Just try to get the condensation off as best you can and take a quick reading as best you can. Uh, if there's a lot of saturated air, a lot of air bubbles in the water, they don't really contribute to turbidity, but they're certainly going to contribute to the light not being able to get through. So. If you can wait for that air to dissipate before you take the sample, fine. I know that's going to compromise the fact that you're supposed to be taking these readings as quickly as possible, but all of these things need to be considered. When, when you're going to take it, you want to make it as easy as possible with just the particles that are floating in there being tested and anything else you're going to try to limit as much as possible. It's not perfect. Either there's going to be a sample chamber, there's going to be a sample cell, uh, you never know, there might be a smudge that you missed or whatever. All these things factor in. Um, you're just trying to eliminate as many of those as you possibly can. Um, again, if you have questions, you can type them in underneath this, and I'll try to monitor this as often as I can and get back to you with answers. Or you can email answers to mkt at l-a-m-o-t-t-e dot com. That's mkt at lamont dot com. Uh, Th those questions will make it to me and then I can respond to you directly. Um, you can also get a hold of our technical support line. You can call 800-344-3100, 800-344-3100, uh, and uh, they will either put you through to my answering machine or they'll get me a message if you have a question. I'm always happy to answer them. I, I hope this was helpful to, in, in some respects. This is um, one of a series, so we'll be going into some more detail on turbidity in, in future ones. Um, I, I'd like to talk a bit more about some of the uh, new technologies and cover a little bit more about sampling and proper sample procedure and transportation and, and, and reporting. But um, those will be out hopefully sometime uh, in the next year or so. Uh, and I really appreciate you uh, tuning in for this, and, and I hope it was informative. Um, so